That was loud. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, absolutely thrilled. Uh, enjoyed both of those talks a lot. Uh, before I start, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, how many people here in the audience have worked with streaming data before? OK, actually a few. And uh, it sounds like, it, uh, I assume, uh, people coming to this meetup, uh, would you classify yourselves as, as developers? How many data scientists? How many people do machine learning? OK, architects? OK, a handful. Uh, let's get started. Uh, thanks very much for having me. I want to talk uh, today. This is going to be quite a different talk, much less uh, technical, much uh, kind of up on a, a, a higher level where you're looking way down at all these different projects. I'm going to talk mainly about uh, a big change that's happening across a lot of industries, and that's a move toward uh, what we're calling stream-first architecture. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about that and why, the re why people are making this change. But it really is a, a, a big disruption in the way people are thinking about things and certainly the way they're architecting solutions. Also, on a, on a larger scale, the way companies are making choices about the teams they want to build and what resources they want to put into them. Uh, also going to talk a little bit about uh, Apache Flink and some other emerging technologies that support this kind of work. Now, I'm going to talk about Apache Flink just to introduce something a little bit different. Most of the work that I'm talking about, uh, people are executing with uh, Spark. Spark streaming is very widely used, and um, uh, that's certainly something I run into a lot. Um, this is just a reminder. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here in Singapore. This is the second time I've been here. I was here for Strata last year. Uh, it's really a fantastic place, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that work gave me the excuse to come. Um, I uh, do consulting for MAPAR Technologies. I'm also a, an author, uh, more recently uh, for O'Reilly, uh, originally um, in this area. Uh, writing about machine learning, about the Apache Mahout project for Manning. Uh, many years ago, my original career was as a research biochemist, and so uh, I worked and wrote much more in that area. But now I'm uh, uh, fully involved in looking at big data and how people are using it. I'm not the person that executes and implements these things, but instead uh, I look mainly at uh, how people are using it, how they're changing it. My introduction to all of this was uh, via machine learning, so that's something I still have a great interest in. I am a committer on the Apache Drill and the Apache Mahout projects. Uh, this is some contact information that I'll repeat at the end. Now, I keep wanting to look at people on this side of the room, and somehow I turn my head, and then we lose the voice, so see if I can remember to do this. Okay, so the first question is, why stream? Why are people turning towards streaming data? And uh, really the answer is that the work that we do, people as data scientists especially, uh, the things that you analyze, you get the best results when uh, the work that you do, the data that you use, is, is the best fit to the way that life really happens. And to put this in a very short way, uh, generally life doesn't happen in batches. So working in batches is a very clever and an often powerful and a very useful way uh, to make things work and as a workaround. But there are situations where being able to work with data as data streams, as a stream of messages, as data that's coming from a series of continuous events, the closer you can get to that in the way you handle work with data and your analysis, uh, in many cases, uh, the easier and the better the results. But there are some surprising differences to begin to work with stream-based architecture, stream-based uh, computing, and some of those actually have to do with situations that really don't have to do with real-time or very low latency events. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, I think for a lot of people, the, the thing that they first think of when they think of uh, working with a lot of streaming data, so popular to talk about IoT or Internet or things, uh, data, and there certainly is a lot of that out, uh, the, the use of sensors, where sensors are going, the amount of data that's being produced, uh, the, the, the techniques, the platforms that people are evolving in to be able to uh, do that processing, some of it at the edge, to transport it back to data centers, to share it among data centers. This is a tremendous uh, area and a tremendous change in industry, and it is certainly a place that we see a lot of people working with streaming data. 
Um, I was just recently up, uh, I was in the UK, I was invited to uh, a talk at the University of Sheffield in Northern England. Um, they have uh, a seven, eight campus center uh, that is the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center. I think it's called the Boeing Advanced Manufacturing Research Center. Absolutely fascinating place, really state of the art to look at the way manufacturing is changing so that you have fully reconfigurable factory floor so that people are being guided by smart tools, smart data. They're bringing engineers and design people very close to the actual manufacturing process itself, changing the way testing is done across a huge range of different uh, manufacturing techniques. And we were there to talk to them uh, about how they're using data and some of these streaming techniques. Uh, but this is just one example. You see it across so many different industries. This isn't just about real-time and sensor data, but it's also about the combination of using uh, data from continuous events. We use the example here of, say, a big industrial setting, such as working uh, with data coming from sensors in a, an, uh, a drilling rig, an oil field, uh, water well drilling, uh, but where you have drills that have an enormous number of sensors collecting data about different parameters, doing this. Uh, at, at a phenomenal rate, so have huge amounts of data coming in. One thing you might do with that data is literally have various sort of threshold dashboards set up, real-time dashboards, so that you're looking for situations to make sure that things don't, don't go out of hand. But what's even more powerful is to be able to do a form of machine learning called predictive maintenance, where you have good long-term records uh, about the maintenance history of all the different parts that are going into an industry, uh, long-term records about when there have been uh, failures and what happened with those failures, and you begin to look for a potential warning or failure signature that happens before uh, there's a failure, before a catastrophic event happens, and the further up ahead of time that you can recognize that kind of signature, the more chance you have to uh, step in, do maintenance, do proactive maintenance, and avoid those problems. So that combination of a good long-term history, huge amounts of, of, of records from that, and being able to uh, uh, look at the pattern of data that's coming in and keep those as a kind of history, not just look at the data, lose it right after you use it, is a very powerful thing, again, across a number of different industries. But Streaming is becoming mainstream, not some of these uh, more exotic or very specialized industries. Um, people for a long time have looked at using streaming data, but using it for very specialized projects. They don't think of it as kind of the central part of their organization. And that's really the thing that's changing. And so I use an example here of something as common as a web-based business. A web-based business that's using, looking for real-time insights, maybe trying to update a real-time dashboard looking at clickstream data. You can imagine uh, how widespread these examples are. So again, these are often the first reason that people come to look at streaming data and how you deliver that data to the processing uh, parts of the architecture. So I've taken this example from a web stream business. I think I may have to do this. There. From a, oop, is that okay? from a web-based business um, where you're looking at data coming in from a number of different sources. Maybe you're taking log data. Uh, you have to have some sort of transport mechanism to get it to your processing. In this case, uh, using this uh, processing maybe to update a real-time dashboard. And so that's what would bring you to that uh, interest in streaming data. Um, but in fact, there are a lot of other reasons to use uh, streaming data beyond those real-time applications, and that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. So we take the same example and sort of expand it. If you have the right kind of stream transport um, and the right kind of architecture built up, you have other classes of use. So rather than just using that streaming data, some kind of very low light latency application, and then discarding the data, although you may want to do that, if you have a way to persist it, uh, depending on how long you want to persist it, it gives you a medium or long-term uh, history, an event-by-event -event history or a long-term auditable log that would be at the bottom of this figure, kind of class C. 
And the other way you might be using that data is to sort of realize out of that a current state of the world, uh, some sort of current status for that data. In this case, I think you use the example of a archival data or maybe just a customer 360 database. Um, those might be stored in a search document. They might be stored in a database. And so there are situations where you actually need to know the event by event uh, history of what's going on, other situations where you want to uh, get insights, uh, immediately real-time insights, but you also may want to pull out of that an aggregate of the current situation. If you have the correct uh, sort of architecture for this and the right kind of stream transport, you really find that at the heart of these systems, it's the tr stream transport technology itself that can make the difference to be able to set up this sort of situation and be able to take advantage of uh, all the different ways in which you want to use streaming data. Uh, in this case, I switched to a medical example. The patterns are really the same through a wide range of different verticals, but that same sort of approach. Uh, you can find, and in, this, in the heart of this is the stream transport technology. Okay, so what kind of stream transport do we consider to be, quote, the right kind to support this kind of stream-first architecture? Well, at this point in the world, I think it's more important to look at the capabilities rather than the individual technology or tool, because there are always new technologies being developed. Um, but at the moment, uh, we find that Apache Kafka, which is an open source technology. How many people in here have used Kafka or are familiar with it? Um, a large number, yeah, very popular. Uh, we find that Kafka has really excellent uh, characteristics, excellent capabilities, and um, I do consulting for MapR. MapR uh, Technologies is a, a large-scale distributed uh, a computing platform, a converged data platform, and as part of that converged platform, it has a stream transport technology called MapR Streams that uses the open source Apache Kafka API. And so they have a similar approach to how you can use either one to build this kind of stream-first architecture. MapR Streams has a few capabilities that are a little different and go beyond what uh, Kafka does, but at this level of thinking about how to build an architecture like this, they're really quite similar. And so in some ways at this point in time, I think they're kind of two, two buckets. Uh, one is the Apache Kafka MapR Streams bucket in terms of what kind of stream transport technology will support this, and the other bucket is everybody else. Uh, and so let's look at why. Uh, one of the greatest differences is that you want a stream transport that has great performance, uh, but also persistence. Some of the older technologies, you have one or the other, but there's too much of a trade-off between them to support this kind of work at the very large scale uh, of data volumes that, that we're talking about. Uh, you really need to be able to do both well. Uh, you need to be able to support your, your stream transport, needs to be able to support multiple producers and multiple consumers, but most importantly, they need to be decoupled. And why decoupled is, is really important is that you want to be able to uh, not have a situation where you're broadcasting data to the consumers, but rather one where the consumer is, is pulling the data that the consumer doesn't even have to be online. In fact, it doesn't even have to exist. You could write it later. You can add a consumer. It doesn't have to exist at the time that the data is delivered. So you want data that you want to transport that can deliver data, have it be available immediately for use by consumers, but they don't have to use it immediately. It's there later, and that's why you need the persistence as well as the high performance. And you want also that independence so that as you add a new consumer, it doesn't affect what's happening with the other consumers. So it sounds like just one simple thing, but it actually is all a world of if difference to be able to support these kinds of uh, new ways of architecting uh, solutions. It's very helpful if you have the ability to configure the time to live for those messages. So the persistence uh, is something that's under your control. This is true for Apache Kafka. It's also true for MapR Streams. Slightly different with MapR Streams because Streams being part of this, it's all part of one technology. It's in the same uh, technology, the same system as the distributed file system, as the NoSQL database, map our streams, it's all one thing, it all runs on one cluster. And so in that case, uh, the, the partitions of a topic uh, in map our streams uh, is distributed across the entire cluster. 
And that means it's actually practical to set that time to live basically for years. And so how practical it is to use it as a really long-term auditable history, that part's a little bit different than Kafka. But the basic principle is the same. And for a lot of use cases, you could use either one. Uh, a feature that MapR Streams has a capability that is very useful for certain use cases, and it is unique to MapR Streams, is the ability to do geo-distributed replication. That is, you can actually do direct stream replication across data centers, and it does this by maintaining offsets. And so what that means is that you're actually sharing data. You're actually sharing the same data. You maintain that knowledge about the sequence at which things happen, uh, even as you uh, duplicate them uh, across data centers or between clusters. This can happen on-premise. It can happen from, from cluster to cluster or data center to data center within cloud computing. Uh, it can happen from on-premise to cloud. And so this is an, a feature that MapR Streams has. It really opens a lot of use cases, uh, a sort of situation that people hadn't really thought about because that capability hadn't been there before. OK, we've talked about this. Absolutely, the, the, the key idea here is multiple producers, multiple consumers, and they're operating in a decoupled fashion. So that's probably the, the single most important thing to keep in mind. Uh, this is a reminder uh, just to uh, tell you, which I think I already have, that part of the why MapR Streams functions slightly differently is that it is actually part of that single technology. It's basically the same code as distributed files and as a NoSQL database, MapRDB. Now, <clears throat> in the basic way that uh, Apache Kafka works and MapR Streams works is really the same. You have multiple producers. You're assigning data to a topic. You have many different topics. In the case of MapR Streams, you can have many more topics, hundreds of thousands or millions of topics, so that kind of goes to extreme situation. And that can give you a much more fine-grained way of dealing with data. But the basic principle is the same. You assign data to a topic. You name the topic, which makes it very easy to keep track of what you're doing. Topics are uh, then broken up into partitions, which helps with load balancing. Uh, as I mentioned, in the case of, of Kafka, a partition tends to live on a single machine. Uh, in the case of Kafka, normally you would be running a separate cluster for Kafka. So you have your stream transfer in one cluster. You have the, the, the systems that you're using uh, for stream processing on a different cluster. If you're working with MapR Streams, you're doing both of those. Maybe you're using Spark Streaming, you're using MapR Streams. Uh, that's all being done on the same cluster. Uh, MapR actually ships with the entire uh, Spark st the stack. Uh, but whatever tool you're using for the stream processing, it's all done together. A difference here is that, uh, especially because you can use such a larger number of topics, with MapR Streams, there is an object. I think it's not named terribly well. It's hard to keep track. But there's an object which is really a collection of streams. It's a first class object in the file system. It's called a stream, and so it's really a collection, of, I said a collection of streams, I'm sorry, a collection of topics. And it's at the stream level in MapR Streams that you can set policies such as time to live, such as the replication across uh, different data centers. You also have very fine-grained uh, control of who has access, and that can make a huge difference. Where you have a multi-tenancy situation, you have multiple stakeholders, even within your organization. You want to control who has access to which streams of data. And so MapR Streams has uh, access control expressions that are set at the stream level. Now, a big trend in the industry, too, uh, is to think about the power of, in an organization or a subpart of an organization, to work in a microservices style of approach. And this has really paid off for a lot of companies. Uh, if you have a new company, if you're working with a startup, it's a very nice idea to think of designing from the, the beginning up in this style. Uh, if you have a very large organization that's uh, designed in a more monolithic way, it's uh, a little more daunting to think about changing over, but a lot of companies are doing this uh, because microservices has, has really paid off so well for different companies. But what is surprising to a lot of people is that Working with streaming data, uh, having stream transport at the heart of your architecture 
is actually a way to support a microservices sort of approach. And this is true whether you use Apache Kafka or you use MapR streams. These principles are the same and they're very, uh, they're very broadly applicable uh, across different industries. And so I'm going to take just this example. Uh, our last speaker was talking a lot about uh, uh, how machine learning is done, uh, the sort of iterative process of uh, using testing data, training data, evaluating, deploying. Uh, I think something that she didn't directly say, but I'm sure she meant, is that evaluation doesn't stop at the point that you feel your model is good enough and you deploy it. It's a continuing process, and even after a model is in production, you want to continue to evaluate, because changes can happen in the model itself or in the code, but more importantly, you're interacting with the real world, and the data, the world, the situations that you're reacting to or learning from uh, change as well. And so you may need to update or change that model, or you come up with a better idea. You come up with better algorithm, better source of data, whatever, and you want to change and use another model. So it's very important to have that ability. Now we take this single example of a uh, credit card working with a, uh, a system to detect credit card fraud. Uh, this one is actually based on the idea that you're detecting card velocity, meaning you're looking at uh, a series of history of transactions for a particular card. You look at where the last transaction was done. Uh, you have a model that can assess whether it's reasonable to think that I can be buying an ice cream uh, here in uh, Singapore and about uh, 10 minutes earlier I bought a pair of sunglasses in, in San Diego in the US. Not likely. Okay, so you can have developed a model, that's our fraud detector. In this case, you're actually uh, looking at a call and response sort of system for the data coming in. Uh, you would normally uh, be storing in a database your last card use, and you would have some system that actually a process running that serves as an updater uh, to be able to update that database. As a new transaction happens, you're comparing that historical data to the new transaction and making that difference. What we've drawn here is a modification of the way it's more traditionally done. And instead of the fraud detector basically speaking directly uh, to that updater system to update the database, and thinking of the database as being kind of the universal central source of knowledge for a lot of different parts of your organization, we've made a change and we've said, suppose you add a data stream. So whether that's Kafka or MapR stream, same idea exactly. So we add a data stream, we kind of pull it outside the box to remind you that the box is not a physical thing, but that's a project that has a specific goal there. And if you have the data that's coming from the fraud detector to a stream, and that stream is shared by a number of different consumers, now different groups have access, different processes have access to that same data. They're not limited by how you process it and change it or aggregate it for this particular database. So now the database is no longer the central source of knowledge for a bunch of different groups, but it becomes the local source of knowledge. And this data stream becomes the shared piece. And I think you can see how that fits the way you want to work in a microservices sort of approach. Now in this case, you're not only sharing data maybe between different groups, somebody's analyzing something entirely different. Uh, you're also keeping the data in kind of a more pure form. You don't always know what you're gonna want to know later. And so having an access to uh, less processed data can be a really useful thing. But you're also able to do this to iterate uh, your own models. And so when you decide later you want to test a new model, you're testing it against the same data, you can set up a second box like this. You're running the same system for a fraud detector that you're testing offline while you're keeping this one functioning online until you want to have it go live. So this provides a lot of flexibility. It's making a big, big difference in the way that people work. Uh, here's an example of w situations where the capability to be able to replicate data across data centers can really pay off. Uh, I was here in Singapore last year for the Strata Conference, first time I'd ever been to Singapore. I was very impressed uh, by being here. Uh, and so I actually used uh, this uh, uh, example that I'm about to show you as the last chapter in a short little book uh, that I recently wrote uh, on Apache Flink. Uh, it's either a very long report or, or a very short book. Uh, it's called Introduction to Apache Flink, and I wrote this with Costas Tumas, uh, who's one of the, the founders of Flink. He's the CEO of a company uh, that's headquartered in Berlin called Data Artisans. 
and I'll tell you a little more about the book, but a lot of the examples uh, that I'm about to talk about come out of this book. I'm sorry, this is a streaming architecture book on the wrong book. So that was the previous book uh, that talks about, wrote this with Ted Dunning uh, from MAPR, and it talks about uh, a lot of the principles we talked about here with uh, stream-first architecture. Uh, this example is actually the last one of this book. Did not use Flink, I apologize for that. Okay, so here in Singapore, I was very impressed when I saw your port and saw the phenomenal amount of shipping, the phenomenal amount of container shipping that's done from here. And so we use this situation to show you how you could use streaming data, uh, picking up data from sensors on, in containers uh, on ships, and how this kind of model could really uh, pay off. It's a little bit different way to think about using this data. So you have multiple stakeholders, whoever owns a shipping company, whoever owns those containers, which may be the shipping company or someone else. Uh, people may lease space on a ship, so you have containers from multiple companies. Uh, you have a stakeholder of whoever owns the, the goods, the products that are actually being shipped. Uh, and you're, you're looking at uh, uh, these stakeholders in a number of different situations. So the little box here, it represents a small cluster that would actually be an onboard cluster. Uh, in this case, we are talking about map our streams uh, because this is a capability that's kind of unique to streams. And so you're picking up uh, data from sensors in the the containers, they may be measuring humidity, uh, temperature, they're actually just indicating that that container exists on that ship at a particular time. And so while the ship's been at sea, that information has been uh, stored in streams on this small cluster. When it comes into a port, it forms a temporary link with an onshore cluster, transfers that information back at headquarters, wherever headquarters may be, maybe in Greece, back in London, wherever, they also want to know. Somebody else uh, manufactured the toys that are in the container, some other part of the world, they want to know what's happening with their product. Now you can also see in this situation, it's very important, I talked about being able to uh, control who has access through access control expressions that are set at the stream level. Uh, in this particular case, not everybody should be able to know what's happening with everybody else's uh, uh, containers or products. Uh, the shipping company obviously needs to be able to track it all. So it comes into port, you do a, a link, you transfer that information, ship down, uh, offload some containers, loads some more, starts heading for the next port that in this case happens to be Singapore. And before it ever gets there, the onshore cluster, in our, in our example in Tokyo, copies that data to that stream to an onshore cluster in Singapore. So Singapore, the shipping owner or maybe a port authority, already knows what's coming. They know what's on the ship and they know what to expect. But while the ship's at sea, it may be not as easy to, ha to have a direct uplink, is they're still collecting information on the onshore cluster about what's happening while the ship is at sea. It comes into port, another temporary link, it does the copy again. We have a little joke at the end here, uh, when it gets to Sydney, some containers fall off the back of the boat. Uh, sometimes you need some very real-time uh, information about what's going on from the sensor data. Maybe the humidity goes up pretty high for those containers. You know something happened, you know they're not there. Uh, this situation, this kind of pattern applies to a lot of different industries, not only different kinds of transportation, but a lot of situations, uh, including uh, what goes on in telecommunication, uh, what goes on with shared information across data centers, say, for people in the ad tech industry, where the ads themselves are actually a shared inventory. It has to be updated very fast. You have different data centers that are located in different places, but they need to have access to the same data. Uh, telecom is an area that obviously uses streaming data a lot at huge levels. They also need to have very responsive uh, machine learning uh, models, particularly anomaly detection, so that they can look at changes in usage. Uh, uh, the previous speaker, Juliet, talked about, uh, I think, it was Juliet that talked about uh, uh, what goes on in telecom. Oh, yes, her model was analyzing churn. And one of the things that can cause churn is obviously uh, poor interrupted service. And one of the situations that we see happen, so you have callers that are, uh, all of their uh, mobile phones are interacting with towers. The towers are trying to send uh, call uh, uh, data records back to a central uh, center. Um, huge amount of data, but oftentimes has to be processed in very short order. 
order, especially for these uh, anomaly detection models. So in this case, we have a situation where you have multiple towers, you have groups of people, they're interacting with the tower nearest them. Suppose there's a sporting event or a concert or something at this one area. Suddenly you have a crowd around that area. A lot of people are communicating. Maybe they're, they're tweeting or whatever they're using their cell phones for. And so suddenly they're not getting very good service because they're overwhelming that tower. In that situation, what you want to be able to do is detect that very quickly, very quickly while it's happening, be able to actually tune this tower to take part of the load. But in order to do that, you have to be able to handle huge amounts of data, have your machine learning model work well, be able to communicate across different data centers. And you need to be able to do that without the kinds of delays that happen when you have to process at a number of different levels. Now, taking this example, and these are real examples in telecommunication, the data collection and handling happens at so many different levels. And if you're doing that by batch, you can have delays that may take 30 minutes at each stage. So by the time you do a couple of jumps, you can see somebody saying, I don't have very good uh, cell phone coverage right now while this event is happening, are not going to be a very happy customer. They're going to be one of the ones that she's going to have to be analyzing in her churn model. So you want to keep customers happy. If you have a system where you have a way to tune uh, the cell phone tower, you have a model and a way to handle and move data across data centers fast enough to do this as a streaming model rather than in batch, you could actually remove, reduce that uh, 30 minutes per, per level of, of uh, data processing down to a few seconds or sub-seconds. And that means suddenly you can respond to events as they happen. So you can imagine a lot of different situations where this really pays off, not just for telecommunications, but that industry is absolutely classic as to why they need these sorts of approaches. Now. I've been talking about the stream transport, and everything that I've set up to now would be uh, useful whether you're using uh, Spark, Spark Streaming, uh, Apache Apex, uh, Storm, and now I'll talk a little bit about Flink. It's not about which processing you're using, it's about how do you set up the system and how do you set up the architecture, how do you deliver the data to those consumers. But let's take just a moment and switch and look a little bit about the consumers. And we'll take, I'll skip through a lot of this because I think there's uh, not, not enough time to go into much detail. Now, I'm talking about Apache Flink. I think it's a very interesting uh, project. It's certainly not, uh, I think, not as well known in Asia, uh, certainly as, as Spark. Uh, how many people here have heard of Flink or have used Flink? Well, have heard of Flink first. Show of hands. Everybody. How many people have actually used it? And very few. Well, the fact is, uh, Flink is very big in Europe. <laughs> it's much better known there. The project originated uh, uh, similar to uh, the way uh, Spark started from the AMP Lab at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Flink started from a project called Stratosphere that it was at a number of research universities, uh, but but. I think most centered in, in Berlin, and uh, as a result, uh, people know about it more. When it came into uh, the Apache Foundation, uh, the name had to change because of a name conflict, and so it was named Flink, which I'm told in German means agile or fast, uh, which this, uh, this processing is. Uh, they picked as their logo a squirrel. Uh, they picked a squirrel of a very unusual color, because it turns out there's a rare kind of squirrel in Berlin, that is an incredible, bizarre color of bright orange. Uh, so it's not just an odd logo, but it's also an odd squirrel. Um, this uh, project came in already with a very large international community uh, of people, uh, developers and users. Uh, it came into the Apache Foundation and uh, was, excuse me, very quickly uh, reached a top level Apache project. Uh, it is actually being used in production uh, by a number of different companies. Uh, here in Asia, the only one I know of is Alibaba uh, that's using a, a derivation of Flink, uh, but it's being used by a number of different companies. A lot more people are experimenting with it. Um, it's, there is a company called Data Artisans. Have people heard of Data Artisans? Yeah, so Data Artisans is a company that was founded by uh, several of the people who uh, originated Flink and are still working on Flink. That company, again, has people in a number of different countries, uh, but the headquarters are in Berlin. 
Uh, Flink has its own conference. Uh, it's called Flink Ford. Uh, it's held in Berlin each year. Uh, this year there's going to be, or in 2017, there's going to be two Flink Ford conferences, one in Berlin and one in San Francisco. Uh, if you go online, you'll find a lot of good information. Data Artisans has a really excellent blog. Uh, MapR has a few uh, resources, uh, including the book that I wrote that they make available for free. Uh, a lot of the content that I'll just point out to you is what's in the book. Uh, <laughs> I laughed at the pointer saying, uh, uh, with our first speaker saying, you know, go and buy my book. Uh, so in fact, this is an O'Reilly book. O'Reilly sells it. You're welcome to go buy it. Uh, that's nice for me. I would get a royalty. But I will let you know that MapR makes this uh, book available uh, for free, uh, the streaming architecture book, for free as well. Uh, if you go to MapR, if you're willing to sign up and put your contact information down, uh, you can read any of these as a download a free PDF. Both books are also available for MapR to just read literally online if you don't want to have to download them. So we've talked about the fact that Flink is the processing step. You would still have something like Apache Kafka uh, to deliver, uh, uh, to transport messages or map our streams, to transport the stream message stream uh, to this processing step. Uh, go to the book. You'll see some of the differences in some of the major uh, choices for stream processing. Uh, Flink uh, is actually true real-time processing, like Apache Storm, an older project. Uh, uh, Apache uh, Spark Streaming has taken a different approach, very clever approach, uh, where they're actually a batch processing. So they do micro-batching. Basically, the idea is that if you keep cutting the batches small enough, it sort of approximates uh, a true streaming. And for many, many use cases, those kinds of latencies are sufficient uh, to meet, meet the SLAs that you need for that project. But there certainly are projects where they're not. Uh, in the past, a lot of people have sort of set up on their system a combination of something like Spark, Spark Streaming to cover a lot of it, and they use uh, something like Apache Storm for the really real-time or low-latency systems. And now people are beginning to look at replacing Apache Storm uh, as that combination with Apache Flink. Uh, Flink has some advantages over Storms. It's, uh, it's much more developer friendly. It's a lot easier to use. And in fact, you can actually use Apache Flink all the way across those latencies because it also can work in batch. Chapter three of this little short book talks about different kinds of correctness. And so I'll just direct you to take a look at the book. I think you'll find that interesting. Uh, the later chapters, uh, Costas wrote, and he goes into a lot more technical detail on these topics, but just as a quick overview, I'll just mention a couple of them. So these are some of the uh, topics that are covered in chapter three. We talk about different forms of correctness, natural fit for sessions, and event time versus processing time, which I'm going to touch on briefly. Uh, other issues are being able to have accuracy after failures. Do you have a stateful uh, system, which Flink is? Uh, Answers when they matter, mainly saying if you can deliver an extremely low latency, in some cases that's what you need to have a kind of correct assumption about what's going on in the real world. And if you have things that are easier for developers and easier to maintain in operations, uh, basically you're less likely to have errors. And so that's a different kind of larger way to look at correctness. Uh, just a touch to think about windowing. Uh, Flink supports windowing in a number of different styles, but this is just a quick comparison of the sort of issues that you get if you do windowing, if you think of it from a micro-batching approach, where if these are a series of different events, the, the horizontal blocks or events in the real world, uh, and the, the dotted lines there are to show what you get if you sort of slice this into micro-batches, there's really never going to be a time that you don't sort of overlap one real-world event with another. It's very hard to find a clean separation between events. Uh, but on the other side, with the gap, you see how this is done with windowing, uh, one, one option of how it's done with windowing in Flink, where you can actually define the window session by that gap between events. And so you get a clean spacing between what's actually happening in the real world. Again, a better fit the way events are actually happening and the way you're handling them in your, in your computing. So uh, take a look at the book, and there are also some good blogs on the uh, Data Artisan site that talk about uh, windowing. 
This is a reminder uh, in case people don't know the difference between event time and processing time. We use the example of Star Wars movies. Uh, and so there's a difference uh, between when the events in the story happen and when the movies came out. And that lets you know the difference between event time and processing time. There are situations where event time will give you much more accurate uh, results than processing time. Isn't time to go into the detail of this particular example, but there's a very good online video uh, done by Jamie Greer, who works for Data Artisans. And uh, uh, I think if you go to the book, you'll find the link to that, and you can actually go through the example that he that he did. Uh, we have some quick little white word walkthroughs on the MapR site. Uh, these are done by Stefan Uwan, who, who is a CTO for Data Artisans and a co-founder, again, of Flink. And he talks about uh, using uh, event time. He also has another one where he talks about using save points, uh, which are related to checkpoints, and how you actually can maintain stateful processing, how you can reprocess data for bug fixes or for different deployment and so forth. And so they're very short videos. They're about five minutes long and uh, a good little introduction to the topic of, and how Flink handles these. Uh, Apache Flink does not ship with MapR, but it does run on MapR. Uh, Storm, I think, still ships with MapR. Uh, the full Flink uh, uh, Spark stack uh, ships with MapR. But uh, Apache Flink has been tested and benchmarked on MapR to see how it works with MapR streams as compared to how it works with Apache Kafka. Um, this was is kind of a quick diagram of, of how the test is set up. It is very straightforward to think that streams is being used for the uh, stream transport and, and Flink for the processing. This was actually an extension of the Yahoo benchmark that was earlier used to test uh, Flink as compared to Storm uh, being supported by Kafka. Uh, they had a little bit of a problem. Flink performs better than Storm, but the whole system didn't run as fast as it should. And this had to do with a network problem because you have two different clusters, again, for the, the stream transport with Kafka and the processing, which is being done in a different cluster. And so uh, one way to fix that is to try to set up a better networking system just for the benchmark, uh, the people who did this actually just did a kind of completely artificial workaround where they just stopped using Kafka. They did, made an artificial data generator right on the same cluster. So you could kind of, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not real, but it's just a way to say, can you get Flink to process much more accurately? Sometime later, uh, the benchmark was done with Flink on MapR streams. And there you don't have that network connector. You have a real system where you're actually using data and uh, um, transporting it to the processing system as you would in a, in a real-world situation. And Flink performed uh, very, very well on MapR streams, actually faster than it has on anything else. So that sums us up. Uh, streaming is a good approach because it's a better way to, to fit the way life happens. Uh, I think you'll have access to the slides and certainly happy to make them available. This is a number of different resources that you might find useful. Several of these are short videos or, or tutorials. Uh, there are a number of different books that I've written on machine learning and other topics. Uh, again, O'Reilly sells them all. MapR makes them available for a free download. Uh, I look around this room and say, I think soon maybe I don't have to put this slide up where I say, please support women in technology, but I see a lot of women in the room, so that's really good news. And I thank you very much for having me here. Yes. Uh, it does handle back pressure. Uh, I think we talked about it in the book. Uh, definitely it's talked about uh, on a blog on the Data Artisan site. But uh, one way that you can find that out is I have exactly one copy of the book. So if you'll come up. Oh, I'm sorry, the question was how does uh, Flank handle back pressure? And uh, take a read through that and see what you find out. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I mean, 
Yes. 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 Um, okay. So I'm going to give you a very simple answer, and if you need a deep, deeper answer, I have two of my colleagues here who can probably the an answer the question even better than I can. Uh, if I was hearing it correctly, uh, the gentleman is saying that, especially in financial industry, uh, there have been examples like this of, of using streaming data for a long time, and obviously other ways of, of, of delivering or transporting the data. So why take an approach for something like Kafka or Kafka-esque, like map our streams? And there are a number of different reasons, um, but I think at the heart of it, probably one that is the, the, the single most important one is that trade-off between persistence and performance. We're talking about uh, very large amounts of data that have to uh, be handled very, very rapidly. And that's not entirely unlike the systems that you were talking about before. And some of those, and things like high performance trading, uh, I think you wouldn't do on a system like this. They're very specialized systems. Uh, they're hard to build. They're expensive. Uh, they're used by big organizations. These are systems that can be used in a much more widespread fashion. Uh, they do do very high performance performance, but they also don't trade off performance for persistence. So I think in a lot of the older systems, depending on your use case, you would pick one transport or the other, depending on which was more important to you. And we're trying, and this, these are situations where you need um, very good performance and persistence, and the persistence, again, supports this microservices approach. It lets you have these long-term auditable logs. It lets you have consumers that you add after the fact. And so they become much more generalized. Uh, the other reason have to do with cost. These are systems that make this kind of work very uh, cost effective and very cost effective across a number of industries. And so I think that's part of why we see these uh, changes happening. Did you have anything you would add to that? Oh, he says good. OK. Uh, anything else? Yes. In my background, I'm very comfortable with um, real-time data processing. But I feel pretty new about stream first architecture. OK. So uh, are we in the total different phase than before? Is it in a different phase than before? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. And it's, it's different in several different ways. Uh, and see if this fits your experience. I think in the past, people saw working with uh, real-time applications as being a sort of specialized project or specialized part of what a, a larger organization or industry might be doing. And so they would have some way to uh, transport or deliver. I mean, you, you could basically just use streaming data directly, but that's probably a bad idea. So if for nothing else, you want uh, some sort of a safety queue, something upstream to sort of collect and deliver the data. So the basic idea is the same. But the question is, do you use it across a whole industry? And that's what I meant about streaming becoming mainstream. I think it's, it's partly a difference in the technology. It's partly different in the data sources. People are, are now using streaming data from sources that maybe they wouldn't have looked at those sources or they would have thrown it away. Uh, there are more sources of streaming data in the sense that people are certainly putting sensors on things they never put sensors on before. So it's a shift not just in the technology, but it's a shift in who's using it who's aware of it, who begins to think that that's a useful way to do their work. So these technologies that I talked about can be useful even if you use them in a sort of isolated, I mean, whether you do a microservices approach or not, if you use them in a sort of isolated project where you need real-time uh, results and real-time uh, uh, analytics done. And that is usually the, the, the real driver that gets people to look at them. But we are beginning to see that people recognize that there's a larger benefit uh, if they design around this stream-first architecture. So it's a shift in thinking. 
And it's the same kind of shift, uh, for example, with MapR streams, same thing with MapR uh, NoSQL databases, where there's a shift in now a technology that allows people to use these setup tables, setup streams, with much less administration, with less burden on IT. You don't have to have a big committee that decides whether you can do this. You don't have to have a big committee that decides uh, whether to change say, the way your table is set up or where you use streams. And the, the last thing, again, is this shift, even if you just look at how people use databases versus thinking of using streams. In some cases, you're actually using that stream in the way that traditionally you would have used a database. And by making that change, you have an enormously larger amount of flexibility. So it's a, it is a change in the technology, but in some ways, it's more a change in the thinking of the people who are using the systems and to recognize that now they can uh, apply this in situations they maybe wouldn't have before. Just a curiosity, may I ask what sort of systems did you work with uh, uh, real-time processing? E-commerce. In e-commerce? E yeah. And did you're using Kafka now? Yeah. Okay. Are you using it uh, uh, strictly for, for some sort of, what, what do you use for the processing or do you design your own? Okay. So she says she's working in, in e-commerce, that she's used uh, Apache Kafka already, is using Kafka, uh, is using Spark for processing, uh, Hive, uh, used to drill, or just looking, uh, using Impala, same, same sort of idea. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you all very much, I really appreciate it.